But now I think we have a very special or a very interesting person. You had a brief interaction with him yesterday. He was on a panel. Uh, his name is Sanjeev Sanyal. I don't think you need any introduction. Uh, he's like a naughty kid in the class. Uh, and, uh, uh, but I think uh, one of the most uh, interesting people you'll meet, one of the most prolific speakers, writers. Uh, in fact, uh, he uh, seems to be an economist, but does more beyond that uh, idea itself. So that is why I say he seems to be an economist, because he does so many things. In fact, his work on history, his book on Ocean of Churn, etc., is just absolutely something worth reading. He's looking at history from a different perspective. But today, he's not really going to be talking about all those things. But what he's going to be talking about is how India is possibly changing or looking at business process reengineering, if I might say, just as a short introduction. Uh, Sanjeev, of course, is member of the Economic Advisory Council uh, to the Prime Minister, uh, was uh, part of, uh, was a principal economic advisor as well with the government of India. And then uh, in his previous avatar, when he was possibly working with some corporate called Deutsche Bank. He was the global strategist for them. I think he worked with them for about 23 odd years, uh, but I think the kind of impact that he's possibly making right now is far bigger and better, uh, because it actually impacts about 1.5, 1.6 billion lives, and that's where it is. Sanjeev, it is such a pleasure to have you with us. Uh, why don't you just join us on the stage and share your views? Thank you, Amit, and thank you to all of you for uh, giving me this opportunity to uh, come here and speak to all of you. What I'm going to speak about is um, the business of how reforms are done, but a specific kind of reform. So you see, uh, you, we all talked over the last uh, day or so about how India is changing um, and economic growth is being generated and so on. The question is, uh, how is this happening? Obviously, it's partly because of big changes in e economic policy. But most of what we usually hear about is about big structural changes. So these are structural changes like the, the introduction of the GST tax system, um, the uh, insolvency in bankruptcy code, the cleaning of the banks using it, uh, or even the um, um, introduction of the um, uh, inflation targeting framework and so on. So these are structural changes. So what are structural changes? Structural changes are changes that relate to changing the structure of something. So for example, introducing GST is like uh, India signed a free trade agreement with itself. Uh, it, uh, the insolvency in bankruptcy code fundamentally changed creditor rights in the country and created a system of uh, creative destruction. So these are structural changes. But these are not the only kind of changes that happen. A lot of the changes that happen are actually nuts and bolts changes relating to processes of the government itself. So this is, given a certain structure, how do you make it more efficient? So there's a whole area of reform called process reforms. Uh, sadly, this is not much written about, not just in India, but worldwide. You know, so there are several academics in this room, a whole area of, of, of uh, reform and policy making that you'll be surprised how little there is actually literature on. Um, you will get it on some specific measure, but as a class, process reforms are almost not uh, studied at all. And I'm going to talk about this because a lot of the efficiency gains that you are now seeing is actually not coming from these big picture structural reforms, which, have, which obviously take the headlines, but from these small nuts and bolts changes. And I'm going to give you some examples of this. Now, the irony is that although in the economics literature, the policy-making literature, process reforms are not much talked about. If you went to the business departments, uh, business process reengineering is the most uh, routine of things that are taught. Um, and yet you would think, and I've just given some examples of papers that are very well known um, about in this field, but basically uh, this is an area that is not taught to our uh, policymakers. Uh, it's not there in the policy discussions and so on. And so I have been trying in recent years to um, make some systematic way in which to study these things. So here is a rough way where we can go about it, just a scheme. So how do you go about doing these nuts and bolts process reforms and efficiency gains? Well, first thing to do is obviously to figure out is there an efficient, inefficient place? Like, why is there a need of reform? That's clearly an obvious thing to ask. 
Now, after you've asked this question, the next thing to do is to document the as-is process. So you take the process as is. All of this, by the way, I'm copying out of what business process uh, guys do. Document the as-is process. Just map out the process. And what happens is very quickly you will realize where the blockages are, where the place, where the money is getting spent, or where is it that uh, time is getting, uh, what is the snags in the system. Very often in a process, it will be one or two uh, snags that actually cause 90% of the delays or cost overruns or whatever it is, the problems that are happening. And identifying them is very important. Then you need to do process analysis for the, uh, then you need to reform that those little bits. So, however you reform them, and I'll give you a whole bunch of examples of that. And then you do something that is absolutely critical. This cannot be a one-time process. Because you now have changed some things, you're, you have to monitor this through feedback loops because whenever you make changes, there will be unintended consequences. There, whatever you try to do may not work and so on and so forth. So this is not a one-time change. Introducing the GST is a one-time activity, but making it actually work is a feedback loop thing which works basically through this process re-engineering. Now, what are the kinds of examples of this? So I've given six types of these kinds of reforms. There can be more. If you can think of one more, I'll add it in there, because I invented this myself. Um, so the first kind is streamlining an existing administrative process. This does not mean that you introduce new laws or regulations. Just take the same thing, make some administrative changes, and the process works better. The second is to change the regulation under existing law. I, I don't go back to parliament, but I take the law underneath whatever the regulations are. I actually make changes in the regulations. Third is... I change the legislation itself, uh, which I have to go back to parliament or, or uh, the state assembly. Fourth, adding capacity at some level of government to re remove bottlenecks. So that is one other way. Removing a requirement of state mandated activity to remove a bottleneck. And finally, merging, closing, restructuring outdated government agencies and processes. So all of these are things that I will talk about now. So the first one uh, kind of uh, process reforms is administrative streamlining. You've heard a little bit about uh, 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 this yesterday. And I'm going to use the illustrate this using something called direct benefits transfer. Now, uh, Mr. Kant uh, yesterday mentioned this as well. But basically here what we are doing, this is not about debating how much money should be given, how, what kind of support should be given to the poor. This is merely about the improving the process through which this is delivered. So if you decide for whatever reason you want to get 100 rupees to X person for whatever reason, my job is to make sure that that 100%, 100 rupees reaches. And so there were many studies going back quite some time suggesting that there were huge leakages in the way various kinds of government support uh, was provided, uh, both by the central government but also by the state government. And there is a fairly well-documented improvement that, uh, that happened as a result of this. So in 2005, the then Planning Commission came up with a report which suggested that 58% of the subsidized food grains issued by the central pool did not reach the targeted beneficiaries. And that out of one rupee worth of income transfer, only 0.27 rupees reached the poor. By the way, this is an improvement on how it used to be in the 80s, where the then Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi famously said only 15% reached the bottom. So in 2005, only 27% was reaching. Now, in order to improve this process, we introduced something called the Jam Trinity. This is basically Aadhaar, that's your unique ID, link it to your mobile number, and then further link through to a bank account. Now, for the very poor, they tend out to be these no-frill accounts called the Jandhan accounts. So using this triangulation, we have been able to create a system that is able to transfer money directly to the person. Right? And since the launch of this, up to March 2022, uh, they have, we managed to weed out 47, uh, sorry, 42 million fake ration cards in the public distribution system which helped save something like 50% of the total. The removal of 41 million fake beneficiaries under the LPG Pahel scheme, deletion of duplicate beneficiaries uh, saving, as you can see, 
410 billion rupees on the Menrega and so on. So this is a dramatic savings as you can see. Okay, without changing anything else, you just the delivery of this dramatically changed. So this is an example of an administrative streamlining. I'm not going to spend too much time on it because this is actually relatively well documented. I'm going on to the number two type of changes, which is less understood. This is about changing actual regulations under the existing law. Now, the illustration I'm going to do on this relates to the IT BPO sector. I deliberately chose this because I'm coming here to the Silicon Valley. Many of you have links to this IT-enabled services and other such sectors. Everybody knows that the BPO IT sector is a very big sector in India. But many of you may not realize <clears throat> that this entire sector used to be uh, regulated by the telecom ministry of all ministries under something called the revised terms and conditions of other service providers 2008 law. Okay, So many of these uh, BPO and other these kinds of uh, companies under law in India is called other service providers. And under this law, till as recently as the year 2020, you had a bunch of requirements which the telecom ministry used to impose on this sector. So let me tell you some of them. This is not a comprehensive list. First of all, there was no clear definition of OSP. So pretty much anybody using any telecom, work from home, etc., could actually be end up being identified as an OSP. And if you were identified as an OSP, then effectively many rules imposed on you. Uh, for example, it was actually illegal till 2020 to work from home unless you had explicit permission from the telecom ministry. Not many people realize this. Many of you were doing extremely illegal things all those years. <laughs> <clears throat> not only that, not only were you supposed to get permission from the telecom ministry, you were supposed to have an EPA BX machine in your basement from every location from where you were work using any IT type of work. Okay? Now, the, 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 my team who was working on this are in the late 20s, and they had never heard of an EPA BX machine till they did this research. They required separate registrations for every ASP. So every location required, so supposing there's a bunch of people who are working from home or from different locations, not good enough for the company to get an OK. It required every location to get it. So if everybody's home, if you happen to be in a tea shop or a coffee shop and working, that had to be actually be certified by the telecom ministry. If you were working from there, otherwise it was illegal. And then there were all kinds of bizarre laws. For example, it didn't allow you to do domestic business and international business in the same location. So supposing you were uh, Singapore Airlines, OK? And you had a back office operation in India. You're supposed to have separate uh, systems for the international and domestic things. Now imagine how bizarre this is. Supposing I'm an Indian citizen in Singapore. I buy a ticket in Singapore and come to India, and I have a problem, and I call the call center. Am I an international or a domestic? And in any case, why do you want to have this thing? After the whole point is I have to have you know, increasing returns to scale from clustering, all of this. So all of this garbage rules were being imposed on this huge sector, which we are all very proud of. And all of them were complaining about it for years, but nothing would happen. Now, I discovered this purely by chance. You see, what happened is, in March of 2020, when the lockdown was introduced, the telecom ministry suddenly came out with a notification, which said that these revised terms of conditions of other service providers 2008 was now held in abeyance till December 20, uh, uh, 2020, or further orders. Which year is earlier. So now, I had, by this point, worked for a few years in the government, and I immediately realized, you know, had a uh, sort of, it didn't smell right. Because when a government department comes up with a notification like this, they are actually, what they are saying is not that they have kept it in abeyance, but what they are trying to tell you, hey, guys, this law actually still applies. So at the end of this process, you will have to apply, uh, uh, abide by this law. That is what they really wanted to signal. So I began to look into this, I mean, and I was astounded that you know, work from home was actually illegal in India. And then, so I made a lot of effort, a lot of fights with various people, because as you can imagine, these laws were used by telecom sector inspectors to do a large amount of rent seeking. There was a whole industry of lawyers, inspectors, etc. Uh, thousands of crores of money were siphoned off 
because trying to get these permissions. Anybody who's run a BPO business in India before 2020 knows what I'm talking about. So we, I, the reforms were done, one round in November 2020, further in June 2021, and as a result of which, <clears throat> new rules came. So one was we, clear, we had clear definition of OSPs, which has now been limited to voice-based BPOs, which basically is becoming a rapidly diminishing sector, so it doesn't really apply to anyone anyway. Interconnectivity of infrastructure sharing between uh, EPA, BX laws, all of those were removed. You can load everything onto the cloud, et cetera, as you wish. You can work from home in remote locations as you wish. Removal of distinction between domestic and international OSPs. All of this has now been done. This didn't require a legislative No, this was done under the same law, just regulations of the department were changed. And look at the benefits from it. So, in December 2021, NASCOM did a study and it showed that 92% of OSPs uh, found that their compliance burdens went down, 92%. Okay, and as you can see, that something like 28% of them said compliance burden went down 50%. Now it didn't require, okay, and almost everybody else saw some improvement on in their compliance burden uh, requirements improving. The reason I'm telling you this, it cost no money, it was just common sense, and huge benefits from this, and the year 21, 22, particularly 22, there's a huge expansion in the sector, at least one part of it be happened because of this. Law, uh, uh, removal of this law. Now I'm going to talk about something about uh, legislative changes. So somewhere only administrative changes, then you have to change the regulation. Here now I have to actually go to the parliament. So I'm talking about here a change that I'm actually trying to live do today. So I deliberately put it here so that you realize this is not something we did in the past. I'm actually trying to do this right now. This relates to a law which is many people in India may not be unaware of, but after traffic rules, this is the biggest source of rent seeking, small time rent seeking in the country. It's called the Legal Metrology Act of 2009. Now, how many of you even know what legal metrology is? There's a gentleman here, and a few others may know what it is. It's basically the laws relating to labels, weights, and measures. Every country in the world has these laws. And <clears throat> what happens here is that um, the way India's these Legal Metrology Act is set up, it is set up in a way that if you do one, uh, one sin in the beginning, you are let off with a small um, uh, penalty. But if you do a second one, you can be sent to jail for as long as seven years. Okay? Now, you can imagine, look at the data you have here in the table, or what happened as a result of this. So remember, many of these uh, 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 legal metrology violations are very minor ones. In fact, you can never avoid them really because there is the, 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 the rules of this are very often done at the state level or are very vague. So what happens is that you'll essentially be caught uh, for a very minor violation. Like for example, instead of writing gram full, you have written GM or something like that. Many of these laws, the, the things you're caught for are these labeling mistakes or very small weight measures changes. There's a gentleman here who has been in trouble because of this, clearly. Um, now, <laughs> okay. So now what happens is look at the number of first offenses. Look at the number of cases. About 100,000, one lakh odd cases a year happen under the first offense, okay? But the second offense is only 12, 5, 3, 11, right? Now, when I made this point to everybody, to the, the, the Ministry of uh, Consumer Affairs, that this doesn't quite make sense, their interpretation of this is, look, the, 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 the law is so fantastic that once you have threatened somebody, it never does anything bad ever again. But the reason the data is like this is obvious. Uh, what happens is that the legal metrology inspectors are effectively, they will find some excuse to get, uh, get you into the net. And after that, they have no real incentive of going for the second uh, offense because effectively they will, they will threaten you with jail and they will um, uh, extract rent from you as well. And as I said, after traffic rules, this is the biggest source of small rent seeking in the country. So now I decided I shall pick a fight on this as well. And so in, there's, uh, recently there's something called the Jan Vishwas Bill, which has now become an act recently. 
uh, we have got rid of some of the worst uh, of these. Um, so they have become somewhat simpler. And, uh, but um, sections 30, 33, and 36, which account for 80% of the cases, are still criminalized. So I have not yet won this battle, but I will win it. We will re-examine this, and I am taking this up. We will make it in, um, you know, there is a need for a legal metrology act in the country. It's not that you don't need it. You do need weights, measures, and other regulations. But we have to have it in a, in a way that is uh, not, you don't have this uh, uh, system of uh, two hits and you're, uh, you know, two misses and you're out kind of system. You have to have it which is uh, graded in some way and is somehow correlated to the size of the uh, error that you're making and so on. And there may really be some people who need to be sent to jail for multiple years, but by and large, this is, you know, somebody with a labeling mistake surely shouldn't be sent there. Now let me move to the next one. This is about an area where you need to increase state capacity. Hang on. This is an area where you need to increase state capacity. Now we heard in the last few days uh, about India wants to become a knowledge economy. And obviously, the patenting system has got to be an important part of this. Unfortunately, Indian patenting systems, till very recently, had not been an area that anybody had looked at. And uh, we have here Mr. Amitabh Kant, who play, has played an important role in trying to do something about it. So I think in 2016 is when he joined the Ministry of Industry, where this department, the, the, the patent office is based. And at that time, we were granting less than 10,000 patents a year. And we were getting filings of about 45,000. So you can imagine, you know, we want to be uh, great knowledge, power, et cetera, not even 10,000 patents. In comparison, the US in that year 2016 was doing over 300,000 patents a year. And China was doing 400,000 patents a year, although I will say there's a caveat here that they have a system of utility patents, which is not very high quality. But still, even if we put that aside, they were still doing decent patents of more than 100,000 a year. So you can see in 2016 what was the ratio. Thanks to the efforts of Mr. Kant, we began to ease up the system. And that number went from less than 10,000. The number has gone in 2022 to 34,000. The very latest number for 2023 is about 50,000. So we have dramatically gone up five times uh, uh, in, in, in the last few years. However, Look at what the other countries did. So US in that time went from, when has gone up to uh, 325,000 patents, um, clearly in a different level. And of course, China has gone off the scale with uh, 8 lakh patents. Now, I agree that many of these patents are garbage. But still, enough of it is good uh, that you can see that they're in a different scale. Now, um, there was some attempt in the years 16, 17, et cetera, to do some hiring in this. So this did improve. And then I began paying attention to it uh, a few years ago. And we began to try and smoothen the process a little bit. The result of this uh, was uh, that uh, you know, some things did improve. So you can see there are two, if those of you who have done patents will know this, there are two levels to it. There's the examiner level, which is the first level. And then there's the controller level. Now, improving the processes at the examiner level meant that the numbers at the examiner level dramatically went down over, over the five-year period. But that doesn't help very much, because as you can see, they just accumulated at the controller level. So why is this happening? This is happening because you just don't have enough manpower. India, after all the, by the way, this is after all the people Mr. Kant had hired. Yeah, we have 900 patent uh, uh, people in the patent office. I think when you joined, there were only 300 or something like that. One minute. One minute. So, okay. So, uh, <laughs> we need to do dramatic hiring of, uh, 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 you know, look at the numbers in China, 13,000, 8,000 in the US. This is just in different level from anything we are. Um, since I have very little time, let me take you through some of the others. Uh, removing a state mandated requirement. Um, you know, there is many mandated things which are outside of government, which the government mandates to do. One of them is, which this government, by the way, introduced, is called mandatory mediation for commercial uh, uh, cases. Now, this is a completely ridiculous thing, because it basically means that if you have a dispute with someone, you have to do a mediation before you go to the court, right? Now, this is unfair, 
because there is no incentive for the mediators to actually perform. And 99% of the cases in the last few years, and I've done data from uh, Mumbai courts, they actually fail. So for a failed process, the fa process that fails for 99% of the cases, they still have to go through six months of delay, paying lawyers, paying a mediator, and nothing happens. So one reform that I want to do is to make mediation voluntary because, <clears throat> well, if, if it works, let that process earn its own place in the, in the system. Why do you want to mandate it? And the final one before I finish, so just give me uh, two minutes extra, is, uh, hang on, where did it go? Yeah, is type six, which is merge, restructure, outdate government, you know, government agencies. So there are large numbers of departments, uh, autonomous bodies that governments at different points in time uh, create for a variety of reasons. Um, and those reasons uh, uh, change after a while, but those agencies never shut down. So the, for example, the central government alone has 850 um, uh, autonomous bodies. This is not including departments and other things. Autonomous bodies, 850. I did uh, some years ago a survey, went through them, and there are hundreds of them who have no known use. They should be shut down. Maybe at some point in history they have a, have a use, but you've got to shut them down at some point in time. And, um, you know, um, I'll give you one example of one so that you get a sense of this. So, there's something called a tariff commission, okay? Now, <clears throat> tariff commission uh, was, uh, the, is, a, uh, is a renaming of a body called Bureau of Industrial Cost and Prices, which used to, till we did the reforms of 1991, used to actually set the prices. Remember, we were a socialist country, so we used to have government-mandated prices. So this was the body that did it. And after 1991, they were market prices. So therefore, what happened as a result of that is that this body had no work to do. So it went from being a very powerful body to having no job. So they should have been shut down. No, so they renamed themselves as the Tariff Commission. Now the odd thing is, it, this body is in the industry ministry. Industry ministry, the industry department has nothing to do with setting of tariffs. This is set by, actually by the Ministry of Finance in consultation maybe with the Commerce Ministry. So this body existed from 1991 to 2021 and essentially did nothing. It suo motor wrote reports from time to time. And when I raised the issue of shutting this down, they got very annoyed with me and complained to the cabinet secretary about me. It had a secretary level official in charge and it had 70 or 80 people working for it. Uh, they had an office in that horrible dark looking building behind Khan Market. Anyway, Lok Naik Bhavan. So yeah, and so I, so I, since they told me they were doing suo motor reports, I asked the uh, finance minister and the uh, chairman of the uh, indirect tax and customs department if they had ever read any of those reports and they had never read any of them. Neither had the Commerce Secretary ever heard of them. So after a lot of arguing and a lot of complaints against me, this, is, this has been shut as of 2022. And I have never understood why people have an objection to shutting it down because nobody lost their job. This is the government. They were just reallocated to something else. And there are a whole bunch of these bodies that, you know, Yes, yes, I shall not name, I know who it is. <laughs> and then, but there's a whole bunch of them, All India Handloom Board, All India Handicraft Board, Central Organization for Modernization of Workshops, etc., etc. Now, I know he's coming onto the stage, <laughs> and he's trying to shut me down now. <laughs> okay, so to conclude, there are a whole bunch of reforms you can do, Analogous to business process outsourcing, uh, business process um, re-engineering that you can do in government. This is not about the Indian government alone. Uh, you can do it in every government, and I'm 100% sure you can do it even in Stanford University. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.